Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. In the 80s in South Africa, former bishop Peter Storey made headlines by challenging apartheid wherever he could. He led the Methodist Church of Southern Africa into what many whites saw as uncomfortable political territory. Today he joins me to talk about his book, I Beg to Differ, Ministry Amid the Tear Gas. Welcome Peter and thanks very much for joining us. Thank you Jill, a pleasure. I would like to start with a quote that is on the back cover of the book um, and where you say, let me say to Mr. Boeta, apartheid is doomed. It has been condemned in the churches, uh, councils of God, rejected by every nation on the planet and is no longer believed in by the people who gave it birth. Apartheid is the God that has failed. Um, so your activism started at the Central Methodist Church uh, in Johannesburg. If those walls could talk, what would they tell us? Well, actually, it began a long before that in my ministry in District 6 and prior to that as well. But as at Central Church, I, I was there for 16 years as their minister. And for me, that really was, I, I guess, the apex of, of my ministry. Um, it was a church which was regarded as the voice of the Methodist Church in Southern Africa. And therefore, the person who held the pulpit there had a responsibility to speak to the nation. We also, I believe, had a responsibility to uh, demonstrate what, what life could look like in a South Africa that was free uh, of apartheid. And so at two levels, it seems, I felt the call to, to speak out to the nation. And, uh, and that became fairly controversial. And yes, uh, there were many people who opposed it and, uh, and, and, and tried to silence us. Uh, in fact, there was a time when the SABC took us off, off the air and wouldn't allow us to broadcast because of the things I was saying and doing at the Central Church. Uh, but also, a much more important level for me was to, to take what was a traditionally white congregation and show that white and black and brown people could in fact become part of one community, mm -hmm. which was fairly revolutionary at the time. And um, it wasn't gr welcomed by everybody in my congregation. We lost 200 members uh, who were outraged that we should think of bringing black people into that congregation. But that was the mentality of the time, even among people who claimed to be enlightened and perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, liberal than, than others. But what happened in spite of losing those members was that uh, an amazing family emerged. We struggled. We worked with the things that, that, that divided us. We, we tried to face honestly our prejudices. Uh, and they weren't all on one side. And, and so we became a community which I regarded as a, a picture, a living model of God's future for South Africa. We also became a sanctuary, a sanctuary of protest for people who were wanting to speak out about their oppression. And uh, so that's where the tear gas came in. There were a number of occasions when the church was surrounded by the security police. There was one occasion when they invaded the sanctuary and actually took up position around the pulpit, pointing their guns at the, at the people in the congregation. Well, did that scare you? Were you frightened? No, I, no. I, I, was, I, was, I can't say I was ever frightened. I was often very angered by it. Mm -hmm. I told the officer in charge of that particular occasion that he had crossed a line which he would regret, that uh, he had walked and uh, he had brought weapons into God's house. And it was an interesting thing because his, his, his troops, his, 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 his squad of policemen, riot police, were wearing their helmets and their bulletproof vests and the, you know, their leather and all that. And I had uh, an elderly member of my congregation who was a Second World War veteran and was not afraid. A relatively conservative man, but he was so annoyed to see these guys. And he walked around and said, don't you know you're in a church? Take those helmets off. We don't wear hats in church. <laughs> and uh, some of them were quite yeah. sheepish and yeah. actually took their helmets off. So uh, we had our moments of, 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 of humor as well. You also did um, work on the ground with people in that church. So a lot of poor people, you allowed them to sleep in there, you fed them. 
Well, you know, Central Methodist Church has a long history of mm -hmm. sanctuary. Um, in, the, uh, in the First and Second World War years, it became a place where servicemen who were passing through uh, found canteens and found counselling and found friendship. Um, and then came the apartheid years when I was there and where, as I say, sanctuary was given to people who, to give them a voice and to speak out. Uh, and then after I had left and my successor, Reverend uh, Paul Varane, um, turned it into a sanctuary for refugees from Zimbabwe, mm. that was also very controversial. Mm. So the church has a long history of being a home for people who other people were rejecting mm. for whatever reason. Let's talk about Robben Island, your relationship with Robben Island and the people who were inmates there. Well, I was a very young minister when I was appointed as chaplain to Robben Island. In fact, I, I was far too inexperienced for that job. But um, when I got there, we were not aware that it was going to be a political prison. And it was only when I arrived there that I found, first of all, Robert Sabukwe, who, who was already there and living in solitary confinement. And because he was a Methodist lay preacher, uh, I had access to him and was able to spend about an hour with him each time I visited the island. It was my first encounter with one of the giant spirits of uh, African leadership. And uh, it was profoundly transforming for me uh, and challenging to, to me. And uh, slowly it, 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 it became, I, I began to feel very, very strongly the outrage of people of this caliber being held in confinement and not being able to make a contribution to the future of our country. And then in 64, uh, the Ravonia trialists arrived. Um, Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Ahmed Kathrada, and the rest. And um, that was very difficult. Uh, they were treated as uh, sort of public enemies, number one. Uh, they were held under immensely secure conditions. They were not released to have a church service with me. Mm. They were held in their cells the, uh, each cell had two doors, a metal grill and a wooden door. The wooden door was open, but the grill was locked. And I had to walk up and down in the, uh, the corridor of uh, the cell block, looking into each cell as I tried to uh, mm. lead prayers or preach or whatever. Uh, so it was a very difficult way of leading worship, but the appreciation was very deep. And I received a lovely letter from Nelson Mandela at one stage um, expressing gratitude for that. The lovely thing, of course, is that most of these guys, except for Ahmed Kantrada, who is a Muslim, and really enjoyed the services, uh, all of them had been educated in mission colleges. So they all knew the Christian hymns, the hymn book, uh, back to front. And so the singing was outstanding. So um, in your long uh, fight, for justice. Um, what would stand out for you as the greatest achievement or the greatest uh, memory? Oh, I think uh, without doubt the, the greatest memory was, uh, was those amazing days in 1994 uh, around the election. I was involved deeply in the peace accord, trying to help uh, damp down the violence which preceded that election. Uh, but um, to I remember being at home and, and watching the television as um, President Mandela was uh, sworn in as our first democratically elected president. And, um, and I remember my, my little house was in Newlands in Johannesburg. I remember w walking to the kitchen and looking up uh, the hill. And uh, that was where Sophia Town had been, which was now called Triumph. That oh terrible insult mm -hmm. where people were moved out of Sophia town and I saw the Church of Christ the King up there and that was where Father Huddleston had been the priest and that is where Desmond Tutu had been an altar boy and, uh, and Desmond Tutu's life had been touched by the Christian faith and they had been born in that church up on the hill in spite of all the insults in spite of all the degradation and the destruction they had been born one of the people who had led us to freedom and I, 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 I thank God for people like Huddleston but, and, and Tutu and 
millions of unnamed people who had sacrificed uh, in order that that man, Mandela, could take that oath of office oh. that day. That for me probably is and was, was the most moving moment. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. I'd, I'd like to get back to Peter's story, the man, the person. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and about the love of your life? Mm. Well, uh, well I, I grew up, I guess, initially very much like any other white kid in Pretoria, uh, living in a little bubble of privilege. We weren't well off, but we were white, and that meant privilege. And there was very little contact with black South Africans. And then my dad was moved to head up a big educational institution called Kilnerton Institution, where about a thousand black students were being educated by the Methodist Church. And that's where I moved into the black world to some extent and began, I think, to realize that life was bigger than just people with pale faces. Um, and, uh, and, and then went on to, to do what I hoped to do with my life, which was to join the Navy and become a naval officer. That was my passion. And then unfortunately, or fortunately, or whatever, there was this ambush by God. There was this kidnap that happened uh, when I just had this powerful sense of calling to the ministry. My dad was a minister, uh, but he had never tried to influence me. And that brought me, uh, that brought me into uh, the ministry and into seminary and then into being a, a pastor of, of, of God's people. Um, when I was still a teenager in high school, I met Elizabeth, who became my wife. We were married for 54 years. Uh, I knew her for 60 years, and uh, she was just one of the remarkable human beings on this planet. Uh, far, far more uh, faithful uh, than I f in terms of, of following Jesus. Uh, uh, very centered with an amazing moral compass and a very quiet and loving way of helping people find their, their best selves. Um, most of her life was spent uh, dealing one-on-one -on -one with people. She loved people and they felt, somehow they felt liberated to speak with her. Uh, she wasn't somebody who liked being up front and in public. But the influence of her life was mm -hmm. quite magnificent and amazing. And when she died, only then did I discover how many, many hundreds of people had been touched mm -hmm. by that life. Sure. She was the love of my life, oh. yes. That's wonderful. It's not everyone who gets that, that honor and privilege to have such a person in their lives. And then you have four sons. I have four sons, yes. I always say that three of them learned from experience and went and did other things. One of them didn't learn from experience, <laughs> and he's also a Methodist minister. <laughs> now, all, 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 three, all four of them are, are, are making a contribution, three of them in this country and one overseas, and I'm very grateful for that. Mm. Now, um, you, your other loves clearly were God and the church. Um, was there any at, ever a time when you doubted in either of them? I've never doubted in <laughs> God. I, I've, had, I've had no doubts at all. I've sometimes <laughs> been very irritated by God, especially having, you know, pulled me away from what I really wanted to do with my life. But, uh, but the church, you know, is a strange creature. Uh, I think Jesus came to, to, to build a community of people who wanted um, perhaps three things. They wanted uh, an intimate relationship with God. They wanted to be, uh, they, want, they, they wanted to know what, God, what kind of world God wanted to see. And then they, they would have wanted to, to follow and to do their best to transform the world into, in that direction. Mm. That's, I think, the church Jesus had in mind. But the church we have in mind is often an institution with rituals and uh, people getting up in fancy dress and things like that. And, uh, you know, a whole lot of fuddy-duddy stuff and a lot of focus on organizations and, um, and, and in-house stuff. Now, m my point is quite simple. The church is only the church when it is engaging the world. The rest of the time it's playing with itself. And so for me, the church only becomes the church that Jesus wanted to see when we are out there 
uh, confronting injustice, reaching for the poor, uh, housing the, the homeless, and, and, and healing the brokenhearted. That, that's when we are being the church. When we are just serving our members, we're just another club, mm. and we're wasting God's time. And then what do you feel about evolutionism um, evolu <laughs> versus creationism? Oh, I can't <laughs> understand anybody who still goes for the creationist <laughs> stuff. It's ridiculous. Mm. You know, uh, we have every possible proof that we are part of, of a, a, an amazing miracle, far more miraculous than an act of creation mm. like that, is the miracle of evolution and the amazing way in which we are still growing and becoming. And I think that that excites God far more than being some kind of magician and saying, well, today I think I'll make fish and tomorrow I think I'll make elephants. And, <laughs> you know, I'll get round to human beings. That, to me, those stories in the Bible are not there to tell us how creation happened. They are to tell us why creation happened. And that's a very important mm -hmm. point. But biology can't tell us the answer to why. Mm -hmm. It tells us the, the answer to how. And, um, and I wish we wouldn't waste our time on such silly arguments. Mm. So uh, I think another big question people tend to ask in terms of religion and, and in terms of God is when things happen, bad things happen, like Rwanda and Burundi and uh, the Holocaust and uh, apartheid. Yes. Where is God in this? Well, we can either, we can either believe in, in, a, in, in a mechanistic God who runs the universe, including human lives, as if we are robots. Or we can believe in a God who loves us so much that God trusts us with free will. Now, if we, if we take free will seriously, I think it is a disgraceful piece of hypocrisy then to blame God for the bad stuff we do with our free will. And uh, so, you know, blaming God for holocausts and so on. And I guess, you know, there are people who say, how could, if God is all powerful, how could God let a thing like that happen? Mm -hmm. Now that's a more, I think, um, understandable question. However, you know, freedom is freedom. And if God says, I'm letting you go to be adult people, I want you to grow into the fullness of, 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 of your, your hum humanity. Um, Desmond Tutu once said, God would rather see us go to hell than, um, than interfere or prevent us, uh, uh, or interfere with our free will. God has trusted us. God has a dream for this world. It's, it's a very clear dream. It's a dream of, of justice and compassion and, and unity and h humaneness. Um, and, uh, and we know what's right. The fact that we screw up is our problem. Don't blame God. Let's get on to Duke University. Yes. Tell me about that, please. Well, in 1997, I retired as, as the bishop of this Johannesburg Soweto area. And both Elizabeth and I felt the need for a break from, uh, you know, the, the tensions that we had lived with for so long in this country. So fortunately, we were invited to, to teach on a, a couple of uh, campuses in the United States. And uh, we were seven years at Duke University Divinity School, an amazing uh, campus. Uh, we were very happy there. And I had the chance then of, of working with young women and men who were training to be pastors in the Methodist Church in the United States, mainly. <coughs> this was a very joyful uh, part of my, my life. I, I think the happiest part of my life in a way because all the, the, the responsibilities linked with the pathologies of our own country were, were left behind for a while. And it was just an amazing thing to see these young people uh, passionately uh, e and excited about serving um, in the world in the name of Christ. And uh, I, I think uh, it was a great privilege to be able to help shape their ministries and, and share something of the experience that we had had over the years here, a very different context, mm -hmm. yeah. So Duke was kind to me, and I hope I left Duke with some, uh, something of a legacy as well. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to South Africa, into what you had helped establish and create, 
the um, post-apartheid society. How do you feel about it? Well, it's a mixture. Okay. It's a mixture of sadness and hope. I, I see us go on steadily downward slope from the, the pinnacle that we reached under Nelson Mandela, and then perhaps a more cynical regime under Thabo Mbeki, and then actually right into the pit of corruption and venality and disgrace under, under, under this man Zuma, mm. um, who, has, who has damaged this country beyond what anyone could possibly calculate. We, we, it's going to take a long time for us to see the full disgrace mm. that he has brought upon us. However, I am never without hope uh, because um, we've been in bad places before, yeah. very dark places in this yeah. country. And uh, I used to say during the apartheid years when we had visitors from overseas, you know, how is it that you can see any hope? And I say, because of the X factor. And they say, well, what is the X factor? And I say, if, it, if I knew what it was, I wouldn't call it the X factor. But there's something about South Africans which, seems, which means that we, we seem to be able to, to pull ourselves out of disaster just at the last <laughs> moment. And this is the last moment. And I think we do have hope under the new mm. president. And I think there's a sincere desire to put us back on, uh, on a road which has some kind of moral compass again. Mm. And uh, I, I think we need to try and help mm -hmm. that to happen. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the people who lead the church today will uh, be very vociferous and uh, very vocal and very committed and very practical about trying to help our country get mm -hmm. back on its feet again. Do you think we have a strong leadership in the church today? Uh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I think the leadership got lost after 94. I think people didn't quite, you know, been leaning against this door so hard for so long and bashing on this door. Suddenly it fell over and then we didn't know what to do with the new situation. And I think there might have been a little bit of uh, feeling, especially among black leaders in our country and in our church, that with the coming of democracy, maybe the kingdom of God had arrived mm -hmm. as well, which of course it doesn't. Mm. And, um, and so I think it's just taken time for the leadership a new generation of leaders to work out how they should relate to the state. And I welcome the resurrection of the South African Council of Churches, and I welcome hearing its voice beginning to hold um, the state accountable again in the ways that uh, we were able to do in mm. the past. Now, there was a time that a lot of people stepped back from the church. Do you think there is maybe a revival and more of an interest on a congregational level um, in, in church? No. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I, I, think, I think the church needs to do some very hard thinking. I think the way we did church has possibly run out of road a bit. I think there's a new generation of people who were not brought up in the church. They were not sent to Sunday school as kids. They know nothing of what is in the scriptures, for mm -hmm. instance. Uh, and therefore, th it's a far more secular society that we have now. And I'm not sure that the way the church does church at the moment is of great um, uh, interest to, to such people. I think we're going to have to work out new ways of being church. Um, we need to take a very hard look at ourselves, the way we worship. You see, the, the problem is that there's a lot of stuff that is happening in the name of church, which I think is absolute nonsense. All these televangelists with their smart suits and their private jets, all the rubbish that has emerged about uh, people exploiting their membership. It's all about money. Mm -hmm. People, there's money in religion. And we better recognize that there is many crooks who are giving Jesus a very bad press mm -hmm. at the moment. And so the true church, if you like, communities who really want to serve God with integrity and to serve the world with integrity, um, need to denounce that kind of religious hucksterism, that cheap nonsense mm -hmm. that, uh, that masquerades as religion. We shouldn't be silent about it. We should be, we should be boldly saying those are frauds. Um, do not do not believe them um, so that and then maybe more important we need to demonstrate the real thing 
which is a, a humble servant spirit set loose in the world, spreading the good news of a God who has a long and painful and passionate and stubborn love affair with this planet mm. and that we need to hear what he is saying or what she is saying <laughs> uh, to us about how to bring about a, a world of, of, of justice and peace. Peter, thank you so much for all of your wonderful insights. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Jill. Thank you. And uh, just to recap, my guest today is Reverend Professor Peter Storey, and his book is I Beg to Differ, Ministry Amid the Tear Gas. And that was it for this edition of Talking Books. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.